Okay, sitting about four feet from my workspace on my shelf, I have found a ream of King James Cascoat 11 by 17 inches, 10 point CIS C1S cover. 250 sheets here. I have no idea when I bought this. I guess I bought it when King James was going out of business. It's the glossy cardstock that I tend to use. I use, uh, you can use a chrome coat now too, but um, I don't remember purchasing this. And I mean, I've obviously had it and it was open, but I just do not recall getting it. Okay, so an 11 by 17, if you don't live in this country, and you know, you, familiar on the uh, inches system. It's basically a double page spread. This is a standard card size that I'm typically working on most of the time, so there's eight of these across this. I hardly ever work on a full page, you know, which is half of this. I've done recently, and even those are, you know, they're, I don't know, they're big, you know, so doing a double page tabloid scene is, it's pretty crazy. I don't I think in terms of the number of um, images and the considerations, it's not just like doing two full page scenes. I think the number of um, variables go up exponentially when we're talking about doubling the space of a already very large, but I don't remember ever doing a scene this size before, so I thought I would give it a try, especially coming off of the, uh, the three um, very large full page scenes that I've done recently. So I'm going to go pick out some stamps and I'm going to try to keep this one fairly simple as much as you can on such a large um, format here. Okay, I have decided on a composition. I'm going with a lot of um, kind of some older stamps just because of the the sheer scale of this one, the area that I'm going to have to fill in. And um, I don't know, this really affords me a, a lot of opportunities to do some, you know, compositional types of arrangements that I haven't done before. Okay, so what I'm thinking about is kind of the autumn foliage, but I'm not going to do it in autumn. I'm going to do kind of more of a spring type of uh, foliage uh, situation, and um, it's going to be my take on um, night, one night in Acadia. That's Acadia National Park. I love Maine, and um, I've been out there a couple times on a workshop and uh, demonstration visits years ago and I love that state and one time I had the opportunity to uh, go out there and uh, teach on one weekend and then I had a whole week um, in between that weekend and the next where there was going to be a convention I, I believe they called it um, oh my gosh I already kind of forgot the name of it um, I don't know. It was basically the convention for the stamp convention um, for the retailers out there. Okay, instead of manufacturers, there there might have been some people that manufactured out there, but for the most part, it was the the retailers. Okay, and anyways, um, I hiked in Acadia National Park, which is not a large park. I think it's one of the smallest of the um, as far as area goes of all the national parks, but um, I just had an incredible time out there. And I, I, I happened to be out there and uh, hit it at full color, which is what they call it when all the leaves are, have uh, changed and they're in their kind of full splendor. And uh, I know that because I, you know, there weren't very many people out there either. But I talked to uh, a ranger um, that was doing um, trail service at the time, trail maintenance, and he said, yeah, all this, and he kind of, you know, went like that. He said, all this wasn't here last week. So, it was just really amazing. Um, 
an amazing thing to behold that color out there and I had all the trails to myself and I hiked around out there for you know five days four days maybe four days and it rained in between there was a storm and a lot of the leaves had fallen um, on the ground and I thought oh man you know it's too bad there was all this really spectacular um, colors but then I realized oh it was kind of cool because the ground the trails were all carpeted in this like a uh, fruity pebble basically <laughs> color scheme of kind of fallen leaves that was carpeted in uh, those uh, leaves like that. It was really amazing. But I've always kind of remembered that and I took a lot of photos and back then it was, it was film so I didn't take as many as I would these days with um, digital photography program but it came back with 4,000 you know photos but um, back then I probably took a, I don't know, several rolls but Man, when my friends saw that, they really wished that they had met me out there because I told several of them, my hiking friends, you know, and uh, as far as uh, as far as um, my trip went, that they should meet me out there, you know, when I was done with my workshops and kind of they can go hiking with me. And <laughs> they still talk about it these days, and that was probably like I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe more. Okay, let's see. I am stamping boulders with lichen right here, and I'm creating this really large ledge here. Okay, there's a, there's a several hikes out there, and um, the elevation elevation change, you know, out there is not that much, you know, relative to uh, like California or you know a lot of other states. But um, so if you're going to uh, thousand feet or something like that. that's pretty high for Acadia so there were several um, trails that kind of you know went along the side of a lake or something like that and kind of went up into the cliffs there and um, you know it overlooked um, some sort of lake down below and uh, that's what I'm trying to create here so I'm really putting this you know ledge with uh, uh, our boulders with lichen here to uh, to you know to work here in terms of the number of impressions here. It's starting to look somewhat patterned, you know. There's this large rock in there that, you know, kind of stands out as far as some kind of a landmark in that space there, but hopefully I can kind of vary that with some um, additional um, foliage and uh, trees that I'll be adding in here um, soon, so. But yeah, there was, there was some kind of plunging, really cool views that, um, that were out there, and I haven't made it back since then, but uh, one of these days I'm going to make it back there. I would recommend it for anyone that loves, and I would really recommend if you're going to go out there, to go in the fall and uh, try and hit it right at peak color. Go out there at the right time, you might as well. But this, to me, I mean, I'm not going to do fall colors. I just don't... I don't want to do too varied a surface just because of the sheer scale and this is going to be somewhat of an experiment for me in terms of the uh, you know the size of this piece here I need to get you know kind of get the uh, I'm still this is I'm kind of working in thirds you know the rule of thirds I didn't go like quite to third right here but it's kind of broken up into thirds and somewhat you know this way one two th you know three it's not quite you know and here's one, two, three. So I'm, I'm kind of working that um, that um, compositional angle, you might say. But um, definitely, there's a lot more uh, considerations here in terms of the space here. That being said, there's a lot of opportunity too. So I'm going to try to take advantage of those opportunities here. Okay, so I have. Um, the, this uh, kind of lake type of thing, but I think I have this ledge here, and it's I, I want a little bit more variation in it. So let me get the smaller version of this um, boulders with lichen, and let me add this and add that uh, to this uh, piece. 
Okay, here's the smaller version of that. This one's about two by four and a half inches, and this one's about one by two and a half, so um, just a smaller version of it. And uh, anytime you get something comes in two different sizes, it, it really represents um, kind of scale and uh, distance within some kind of scene. And when we're talking about landscape stamping, scenic stamping, whatever you want to call it, um, it's it's really fun to play around with scale so that we can kind of represent um, different distances within um, our piece. Okay. There's a lot of repetition of form out in nature too. Um, they say no two things are alike, but some things can sure as heck look similar, right? Like two, you know, like a whole forest of trees, you know, looked at from you know a mile away. You're not gonna really see uh, too many differences from that um, distance there. But anyways, I'm just kind of adding some of this in here and just kind of varying it a touch. Okay, something like that. And do we need, you know, is there a you know, need for um, positioners and whatnot? No, not at all. We're just uh, stacking and overlapping our images, okay? We want things to be nice and easy. And I'm sure um, that's something that uh, everyone can appreciate. <laughs> All right, so this is the autumn imagery right here. I'm trying to compose. What I'll do is I'll place this one right here, I think. And you can see how these are kind of designed to be uh, merge together this way right here, okay? And then this one can go like this. And on the other side of that one, you can go like that. So you can kind of keep doing as long as you want. That's why I'm kind of thinking about going with this one right here. I have, you know, these big images that can be uh, sandwiched together, you know, as, as long as you want it to be. You know, I could be working on a you know, a piece of paper twice as long as this one, it would be fine. Okay, so this is going to be my night in Acadia scene, so that's why um, I'm just going to color these black, because in the, you know, like, dead of night, you wouldn't be able to see a lot of color, and then I won't have to employ, you know, the use of, I don't know, ten different colors in this, um, ten different color schemes in this piece. I can just keep it you know, fairly simple. Uh, for the sake of making my experiment much easier on me. Okay, let's see. Put it lower, then we can have more sky. Put it higher, and we can have more water down below. Maybe we could put it right in the, you know, somewhere in the middle, maybe. I could put it out here, maybe, too. In fact, I just thought of something. I mean, Katie, we can, you know, it's right next to the ocean, so... Oh, boy. So maybe I'll do both. I'll have some lake, and I'll have ocean in the distance. And maybe some, that'll be a perfect opportunity for my islands. I put a nice big stack of paper underneath my uh, underneath my um, paper right here, my card stock. So I have plenty of cushion, you know, on something on what I'm stamping. So done this, I've uh, re-inked. <laughs> Oops. I think this one goes. Let me see. This one goes here. Okay. I've re-inked my uh, ink pad here so that I have plenty of ink on my pad to apply the to the paper. I just want to make things nice and easy for myself, especially when there's so much space to uh, to fill in here.
kind of the lighting scheme is going to be interesting just because I have so much space to fill in. I keep saying that, but um, I don't know. This is kind of a stamping that's large is kind of a shock to my system. Okay, I'm just overlapping my previous impression probably, probably about a quarter inch or so. Eighth inch to a quarter inch. You know, there's plenty of uh, kind of wiggle room in there. I didn't match that up perfectly, but who cares? It will not matter one bit. Okay, so I have this little space over here that I want to fill in, so I'm just going to mask off. See, this is your, you know, the masking, you know, the amount of masking that you would uh, have to do or have to employ the use of, um, I don't know, in masking with these stamps about nine out of ten times. There are times when, you know, maybe you can go with a, you know, a cutout mask or something like that. Um, most of the times it is not needed, nor is it kind of conducive to the overall kind of blending of imagery. You want things to blend in, so you want things to overlap and kind of merge in with one another. Okay, filling in with the tree cluster stamp. Okay, see that right there? So it kind of fills in up there. Now, you know, I mean, uh, just on the spur of the moment, I was thinking about some kind of islands out here, and I'll put in some sort of horizon line, like a like an ocean or whatnot. So, what I'm thinking about doing here is building up some of these trees. So we'll put some more um, deciduous trees out there in the background. And, let me see, here, I had one of them just, oh, here's one of them, the uh, uh, maple trio, okay? So it'll just be some little bit of extra foliage back in there. So, again, I'll just kind of mask off like this some of these trees. Some of the trees are fairly dark, so I don't really need to mask them off because they're solid. But I'll just kind of plop some of these down in here, like about like so, and just kind of have this uh, kind of distant uh, tree line um, build. Okay. Stamping the whole tree. I don't want the trunks in there because they're supposed to be, you know, very distant. So, just kind of adding some in, like about like so. And um, let's see. I've been using this one a lot because it just happens to be on my uh, table. But let's do some um, intersperse some of these um, these pines into there. Now I'm going to be taking some liberties with this, you know, this isn't supposed to be some kind of like a photographic, uh, you know, reference of a uh, hey kitty. It's going to, ha you know, I don't have things, you know, exactly, you know, the types of things that are out there. So um, what I'm going to do is I'll just give kind of a, an impression of it. So I'm, I'm going to be taking, you know, some, you know, a lot of liberties with, um, with it. It's going to be done in the spirit of my memory of the location, um, for sure. <laughs> so, it's good to kind of try to, you know, match up once in a while something, you know, with uh, an actual location, but at some point in time, this is what I would always recommend, you might kind of start off with some sort of notion of how you want something to be, and that kind of provides you as a, as a nice foundational standpoint from a visual or an emotional standpoint, um, you know, as far as your the connection with the location, but at some point in time, and it could happen very early on within the uh, 
within the uh, the the creation of your scene, um, you just have to kind of go in the direction that it seems to want to go, or that it's able to go, and uh, you just kind of have to try to guide it in that direction. It's like you might be saying, well, what does that mean? You know, it's kind of easier said than done. Well, if you don't have certain images, then you just kind of make do, you know, um, and just use kind of whatever you have. And, uh, you know, you can kind of stay within that spirit for sure. Okay, so here's some other trees. These are the tree clusters. This is the larger version of the smaller one, okay? So let's see, these ones are kind of lower, you know, and off in the distance. I'll put these ones up on this ledge, so it'll give this ledge a connection with that background down there. I probably should have left some space in here for some other bushes and whatnot, but I didn't, so let's just go with it. It's one of those, see that's like one of those types of things I was talking about. You just kind of have to just go with uh, kind of what's been um, created here. putting some of those in there. Yeah, you can get a smaller version of that too. Like stem it a little bit lower. Like so. You can put some on the other side of this ledge right over here. There were some lakes out there where there's kind of like a, I don't know, bare kind of rock portion on top of the hill, but, you know, the trees were kind of lower, even though you aren't going to, you know, a tremendous, you know, elevation gain or something like that. Um, just going up um, a couple hundred feet, uh, you can get this kind of change of um, terrain up there. It was, it was really quite nice. I can't say it enough. Let's see if I can get some of their into this area right here. Why not? I'll get some of their trees within this rock. So what I'm doing is I'm masking off some of these rocks, and what I'll do is I'll have the tree kind of growing out maybe from some of those rocks, which you often see in nature. Sometimes it's kind of like baffling that, you know, you get um, some trees growing where they do. There's growing in a crack, but it's probably where nature, you know, if a seed drops in the crack, there might not be hardly any soil, but it's where the roots can really get a foothold. So, you know, with rain and runoff and snow and, you know, change of seasons and things like that, the, the roots can kind of cling, you know, fast when it's kind of wedged into this little tiny uh, crack or something like that. It's really uh, quite interesting. Okay, that one's kind of obscure there, but um, I don't know. It looks okay. Not great. And it is looking rather busy. Um, and I know that. But um, what we'll do is we'll do just like we do in um, smaller scenes. We'll bring kind of a cohesive element to it with the, the use of tone and uh, all the other tricks we can do. Okay, so... Um, this is some, I'm going to bring some other elements into it too, but um, I might do that later. I'm going to bring like some other types of trees and whatnot. Oh. We'll go with some bear trees too. That would look really fantastic in here. I'm going to leave that though as a kind of a secondary um, impression um, process. Okay, so I like the idea of um, some islands kind of going out there in the distance because that's what you see. And then I, I want a moon somewhere out here, maybe in this third of it or something like that. So I don't know figure out some kind of horizon within this given space right here. Okay, so let me grab my island stamps. 
Okay, I have um, some different island imagery that I'll use on here. I really need a different plot than this one. It's so huge for this very narrow stamp, but um, it's all I have right now. I need to get. Some, I think I need some more tack and peel in a kind of a narrow, long acrylic block. Okay. Let's see. We'll put one island out here. Okay. In some ways, I you know, it might be good to do these in kind of different values, like possibly lighter values than black, so that it looks like it kind of recedes off into the distance a little bit more than it will being stamped in black, but we're just going to keep things really, you know, as easy as possible um, for me. Just again, because of the sheer just amount of space that I have to, uh, to consider in the piece here. And it's quite vast. Okay, let's go with a different island stamp. Okay, let's see, maybe I'll come down right. We'll come over here, we'll have it kind of coming in from the outside edge in like that. And let's come up with another couple um, smaller ones. As I finish with all the stamps here, I need to I need to put them all in some pile somewhere so that I remember which one I've used when I uh, write up this uh, video. Okay, one one or two more of these uh, island stamps. somewhere. Doing the horizon across this is going to be uh, interesting. I've never done a horizon that long. Be I don't know. I, I guess it should be fairly easy. I'll just you know, fold over a piece of paper. I just do it with ink if you haven't seen me do that before. Okay. There's this one right here. Really quite small. I think there's one even smaller than this. But this is kind of the smaller version of this one. So remember, kind of repetition of form. All right, there's four of them. Let me go with another one out here. And I'll kind of put it out here in the distance. I'll have it coming in from kind of off the page, into the page, or out of the scene, into the scene, like that. All right, so this is those are our island stamps out there. Man, this is so crazy. Okay. Um Looking, I'm looking. Let's see. I'm trying to think if I want something down here. I think I do. I, I mean, this could all be just be water right here in Lake. But I think some extra trees down here in foliage. 
like it's like it's the other side. It's the near side of the island that I'm, you know, looking at the tops of the tree line for. All right. I just want to avoid um, potential monotony in such a huge space. And ideally, you want you know we want to make this entire scene um, kind of you want there to be visual interest running throughout and not for you know not for not not to be just <laughs> I can't even talk um, filler space you know just because we have to fill it in we want each space to count so kind of going for things that are going to look nice and interesting from a visual standpoint, from a narrative standpoint, lighting, subject matter, etc. Okay? All right, so here's some trees. This is the uh, maple pear. It just has a little bit of a uh, larger kind of form than the uh, uh, maple trio. You could use the maple trio, though, okay? All right, so there's some trees down here. Let's go, let's build them up a little, little bit, though. Let's go, let's blot this off right here, and kind of uh, mass this off down here. Go like that. Just so I'm kind of getting the tops of it. doesn't look varied there though, does it? So, let's add some, uh, let's add some larger trees into that space. I have the larger pine tree here. I won't go too tall with it, but it'll kind of match, you know, what's happening back in that space. All right, so, where do we put it? I'll have it coming kind of interspersed within this deciduous um, kind of canopy of trees. All right, Get those right there. I think I'll use this again, so I'm not going to put that away quite yet. Um, okay, let's see. I have some leaves here, but let's let's stamp those in later. And some other trees. I think I'm ready to start toning into the scene, believe it or not. I'm saying that to myself. <laughs> oh, here's some. Uh, okay, yeah. Let's let's start kind of approaching this um, in terms of a. Uh, lighting scheme. Okay, and I was going to put a moon in here, but I'm not sure if I'm going to have space up here. I'm just going to have about an inch of space probably between my uh, horizon line that I'll kind of create and the top. Hmm. Well, let me figure that one out. But you know what, though? I might have to wait because this is... Well, it's not terribly wet, but it's a little bit in here still. Boy. Yeah, I think I'll color this in later. This is a little bit... I do see it's kind of puddled up in here. 
and since I am doing like a really big scene, let's hold on that until uh, I can kind of uh, color freely. And I just re-inked this because I knew how much black ink I was going to use all over here. So anyway, so here's our foundation right here. Huge. You know, I haven't decided what I'm going to do over here quite yet, but I, I want there to be something reasonably interesting when I get over here. And I'm, I don't know, I'm thinking I put in too much texture in there that's too heavy, so I'm not really quite sure, but we'll figure it out. Maybe some, you know, just misty, cloudy effects in here or something of that sort. And then I'll have to try to uh, color that in and retain a lot of form in here, even though it's going to be a nighttime scene fairly dark. Have a moon up here or something like that, maybe some light on the, uh, yeah, maybe some light right in here. That would be kind of interesting to have a, a central kind of a moon on the horizon, maybe? Something like that? That may be kind of interesting. And, you know, have the light coming through here like that with some shadows being cast by the moon. And then some, you know, kind of faint ripply uh, textures on the uh, water surface right over there. Okay, so, anyways, huge composition right here, and uh, I will color this in after everything dries. Okay, one thing I'm going to do on this scene is I'm going to do it in stages. I have a little bit of time right now to uh, stamp out a couple of other elements in here, so I thought I'd do that, and then allow them to dry. I guess what I'm going to do now tends to be pretty bold and thick with ink, especially with the brand, uh, not brand new, but a newly re-inked uh, pad. And one of the things I want to do is I want to break up this big ledge with some additional imagery, just so it's not so monotonous in terms of the texture and pattern that's been um, created here. So I want to go for some nice deep prints. Now, I'll be using some other um, elements in here uh, later on, though, with um, some darker color, Versifying ink. But this we'll put on with um, the Marvy, which isn't quite as dark, I've found, fairly recently. I would have thought they were pretty close, but... And they are, relatively speaking, but that Versafine is a, a clear winner in terms of the uh, darkness of it. Okay, ah, uh, gardeners. Okay, hopefully that is it. Now let's create a little separation between this ledge and these trees down below. again here. Uh. in here. Alright, I'm going to pause this here. Okay, I've created a little bit more separation right here by having these darker trees down here. And I'm looking at the overall here. Knowing that I can add in some other elements in here later on, but... Um, I don't know, I, I just, I feel I need to go, I need to block this in more, I need to be a lot more bold at this point in time than I have been. 
just, uh, I don't know, there's, no, 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 there's different kind of compositional, um, kind of decisions that this is affording me, this format is affording me, and I need to kind of get with that, um, get with the program here. So, kind of just more space for kind of vast sweeping areas with um, kind of bolder, um, not boulders as in like rock boulders, but um, bold as in, you know, kind of a uh, decisive um, decisions and uh, kind of big, visible ones. Okay, so, otherwise, see this area right here is, it's kind of become, you know, just this big, gigantic, I, I mean, I, I really asked for it by making this area so huge like that, but I don't know, that's kind of the, like the, uh, the visual that I remember, so I wanted to do it that way, but, um, definitely need to kind of fill it in with some other things. And I really want to do, I don't know, I'm kind of rethinking it in terms of, you know, possibly doing that fall type of foliage, but I don't know if I want to on this one, this initial one. Like, you know, I could do some reds and oranges and greens in here, kind of for that fall type of uh, coloring in here, but, um, I don't know if I want to do that right now. I kind of want to do it in the spirit of uh, spring and uh, where everything's green. All right, this this is the spruce large, by the way, and it seems to be kind of doing what I intended it to do, which is kind of making a bolder statement and kind of breaking apart the, that monotony um, that I was talking about a little bit. Okay, let's go in here. Let's, let's go with a big one right in here. So we have repetition of form in here, in the form of these trees. We have repetition of form in terms of these boulders. We just don't want so much repetition of form with the boulders. The trees are, are fine to have a lot of similarity, but um, that boulder area is kind of extreme. I mean, we're talking about, you know, I don't know what that is. 14 inches of it by, I don't know. I mean, it's not here, but this is a really large space with that um, same form. Okay, I'll try to cluster these trees a little bit. So we like a cluster here and a cluster here. One of the things we want to try to avoid is having too much symmetry where you kind of space everyone out, kind of, you know, uh, identically in terms of the uh, distance between one and the other. Okay. I say something like that. I, I think that I think that served its purpose there. This is kind of aiming <laughs> out of this direction too. Kind of, it's leaving a bit of an opening um, for the viewer to kind of enter the scene. And I think that looks pretty good right now. It's a good foundation. I, I want to go with some additional things in here, but um, I, th 
that'll be good for now. Uh, I'm trying to think of um, some reeds or some brush in here too. Do I do that now or do I wait for that? Should I do some of it? Might as well do it now. We'll get out some of this um, vast, kind of sweeping, you know, um, compositional elements right now. In terms of the larger strokes, you might say, the larger brush strokes, figuratively. Okay, this one is the um, leafless pines, large, and this will be a fairly large one. I'll probably add some more of this later on, but um, let's go with a couple large pieces right now. Stagger the height a little bit. Let's go for a smaller version of it. It gets really busy in here, so I'm trying to think of a kind of placement of it um, in an area that's not too busy where it'll show up. Uh, and where it's not going to align perfectly with another one, you know, because I want it kind of staggered and varied. In the end, will it really matter? Well, maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say, because I'll be toning in a lot of this, so a lot of this won't be quite as apparent. Okay. This is one of those instances where, um, kind of the higher you stamp something in the scene, it, it could represent something farther off in the distance, like certainly those islands right there are the farthest element right now within the scene. But since I'm doing this big, huge, vast slope, you know, some of this represents something, 
you know, like an equal distance, kind of more like that. I mean, that, and the, you know, could be going back in the distance, but all this could be relatively close by. Perhaps, or not. <laughs> I usually say the things that are lower here are closer to you, but, you know, something like this and this, even though it is going up here, and it's, you know, at the equal kind of a height of these ones, these are obviously, you know, much farther off in the distance. Okay, let's go with that. All right, this is starting to come alive, I think, in terms of the composition. This big, huge area right there, especially. I could go a little bit more over here. I think I'll leave that for the um, for the end and for the final, the versifying pad over here. I don't want to block it off too much because I think I like what's going on in there. So we'll wait a little bit. God, this is so big. It's so crazy. But it's really kind of fun too. Because you're really, you know, in theory, these stamps, I mean, I make most of these stamps to be used on a quarter size page card, you know, for card making. Standard cards format, but in theory, you know, when I draw these designs, they, you know, they should be able to interlink and, you know, stamp over an unlimited, you know, amount of, of space if you have it. So. Um, this is a way to kind of test that out. It's not five feet, but it, it is pretty large. I've seen one bigger than this at, uh, at a store before. And this guy did, I don't know, it must have been three feet across. It wasn't quite as high, but it was probably, I don't know, maybe eight and a half by, I don't know, three feet or so. It was really long. I think it was a lake. That, it might have been Lakeside Cove that he did. But... Um, yeah, that was at a little bazaar in Lake Elsinore, California, at the store there. Okay, this looks pretty good. I can see all these trees are pretty wet now, so that's why I thought it would be good to stamp those in there right now and allow them to dry before I got to the, uh, the coloring portion of this. And I really feel like getting that horizon line down there, so it'll be a matter of kind of uh, taking a piece of paper and trying to get a nice straight crease across it to create um, a mask where I can kind of lay down that horizon line up there. And then we'll see about, um, I really feel like getting some kind of moon in there, and I, I thought it might have to be kind of like a setting or a rising moon out there in the distance, so we'll kind of figure that out, and I'll figure out what kind of uh, moon I want to stamp in there. So, Okay, so, um, I don't know, compositional, um, the compositional portion of this, part two, and then uh, I'll take a look at this and see what else needs to be done. And uh, if nothing more, at this point in time, we'll get to um, some of the uh, the coloring portion of it. I was looking at some of these trees over here. I could have used those as bushes right in here too. Hmm. Okay. Well. Okay, here is uh, day three. I barely had a chance to work on this yesterday. But, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> kind of having these breaks has given me, I don't know, kind of a, a notion of a, kind of making a change of course, at least in the coloring portion of this scene. I don't know, it's really coming around, um, especially with the addition of these trees here where... I don't know, just kind of my notion on what to color this like has changed. I, I'm what, I think I want to go for more variation in here than what I was originally intending. I was intending on going with something a much, you know, going with something much more simple than what I'm thinking about now. And I really am thinking about applying a lot of different colors to this one now and uh, variations of tone for this whole big um, slope right here, and then the trees, and the water, two bodies of water right here, and, and the horizon, and <laughs> the sky up there, I don't know, I, I figure I might as well just do it, that's what I'm inspired to do now at least. 
All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to fold it over. I'd say it's, I don't know, maybe about an inch or so, roughly about. And I want to get this pretty straight because of the, uh, just the sheer length of this. So I'm, let's see here. It has to be straight enough. I just don't want to do it on a, you know, a noticeable diagonal here. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of creating this little fold right here, right? Okay, like that. And that is what is going to tuck under right here. Okay, like that. And that's going to be my horizon line right there. Let me see, let me make sure that that's where I want it to go. Yeah, I was thinking about a little bit shorter than that, but... If I do that, it'll give me a little bit more sky area. Let me see here. Okay, that's what we'll do. I don't know. I was thinking maybe a quarter inch shorter. Let me see here. Okay, let me try to fold that again. <laughs> or here, let me do it on this side. Okay. I thought it, it should be a little bit more narrow. I don't know, just going off of uh, instinct here. My gut, nothing more logical, just... Okay, that one's a little bit shorter. Okay, so there's my horizon. I, I thought it was time to um, start bringing in that tone into here and to define that top section. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, now I'm going to bring in something that I did, was it last week, um, where I used some London Fog, and I just went into some grayscale, and I'll do that with the Marvy Black and the Marvy Gray. Okay, well, let's start off with... The London Fog because memento inks are really quite slippery and they make for a really good solid foundation. Alright, now I am going with grayscale here. I could go with a color out of the color scheme, which would be blue for the, that water. I think that's what color I'm going to go with, but um, gray is a neutral. At least this one is. It's not like a warm gray or a cool gray. And um, I can, d yeah, I can still think about using something kind of, well, this one's very light, but something quite neutral is that you can change or add to this kind of foundation coat of value, tone, um, whatever color you want to, um, right over the top of it. And it won't kind of affect it either way, except it'll be kind of a darker version of it because you're putting it over a uh, gray instead of white. Okay, let's see here. I'm starting to smear some of my imagery. I guess, I don't know, I, I probably, I really used a lot of ink in my um, ink pad here before I used it on this thing, so there might be some just residual um, kind of built up color where it was like a thick puddle of it and then it dried so it kind of it's like pulling off kind of a I don't know this little build up like a chalky build up where that ink is dried you know where it was really thick okay so this in general is going to be I'm thinking about putting the lighting somewhere maybe I'll put it over here Right here, so we'll go about thirds. I'll put it right here. I'll put my light source right here, okay, over the sky. So I'll take this right, this kind of this horizon line right up to that point, I think. Okay, so I know where it's going to be, so let me put plenty of ink over here, okay? So I'm not just toning in, I'm kind of a uh, 
saturating some of my paper with this um, ink here because it is the first color and I want to give a pretty good solid foundation coat onto this. And boy, it is a big area, so I only have to apply quite a bit. Okay, let's, let's start bringing it in from this side now, too. All right, this is a little bit awkward here. Let me hold the paper down here with my hand. I really could use a reinker of London Fog. That'll be, up, be on my list. I see myself using this quite a bit in the future. All right, let's see if we can see this, on, especially on camera. Okay. All right, so there's my horizon. It isn't very dark, is it? It's because it's a fairly light, um, it's a fairly light value of uh, gray value. As far as grays go, it's it's like a I don't know at most a twenty percent gray maybe. It's probably more like fifteen. Yeah, I've achieved a you know a full saturation of it here, so it's just not really going to get any darker. But here's the thing. This is the thing that makes things a lot easier for you um, when we're doing this technique here, at least. And by the, well, you know, when I say technique, I don't mean stampscape stamps. It's just using glossy paper and layered die-based things. Stampscapes can be used with any medium that you want, just like any stamp, you know, of any type. You know, a stamp that says "Happy Birthday" doesn't mean oh, we have to use it in a certain technique, you know. But, with the layered dye base technique, I would recommend a lot of ink on your first tone color. And that's one of the biggest things that um, people that don't have, you know, that have kind of a clunkier time with it, they just don't put enough ink down on their foundation coat. When you do that, as I've shown in other videos, it makes a world of difference as far as ease goes, and I need this one to be nice and um, user-friendly because I have so much area to fill in here. I don't want to be fighting with kind of a dry piece of paper and applying my inks on here. I want things to flow nice and smoothly like that. See that? My next color, it just blends right in. So don't just color with your first color. Kind of really saturate and uh, add a lot of that moisture into your paper. And that makes things so much easier with all the ensuing colors. Okay. Yeah, it's very easy to do. And if you have re-inker, and you can just put a couple drops on here. It makes things even easier and faster, too. I don't know how many people are going to be doing 11 by 17s, but <laughs> even on a quarter page card, you know, if you have um, some of that uh, re inker fluid on there, it just, I don't know, it goes really fast. Okay, let's see. In fact, I added so much, it's kind of hard to apply some of this color. My next color right here, the, the, this is gray from Marvy, by the way, if I didn't say. Yeah, there's a little bit of residual 
black. It's kind of smearing a little bit, but it's all right. I'm kind of adding it in this direction so it'll just kind of be like streaks in my water, which I tend to do anyway. I'll just make it part of my streaking action. Okay, so there you have it right there. There's a, my horizon line. I'll add more horizon line too. Um, we'll do it in black here. So I'll make a little bit stronger kind of a horizon statement, you know, with a darker um, line. Okay. And then we'll come up and we, we need to add more to the sky too, so it's not just going to be this isolated kind of a um, addition of this um, tone into that water area. We'll use it um, in more areas, but I want to work in just this small area first, you know, this horizon line, because um, I want to work while my ink is wet up there, so I don't have to re-ink, okay? Okay, I can add some, kind of at the base of these islands like this, too. And that will kind of give them some shadows. I'll we'll establish the shadows at the base of them. And when I'm working with my stylus tool, I'm kind of working with it on edge, as opposed to the flat area. I can get a kind of a, a narrower application of ink that way. And I can tell this page is starting to dry here, so my stylus tool is kind of grabbing the paper a little bit more. Okay, so... I want to use kind of a light, nice light touch here. So that I don't get the sponge shape of the tool itself. I just get a streak of color. some shadows at the base of these.
we've given the shadows to these islands to really kind of anchor them down in that uh, into their surface, the water's surface. Okay. Anyways, there's my horizon there. <laughs> I mean, it looks really odd right now because nothing else is kind of shaded and rendered like that. So I'll just bring everything up up to that, but I, just, I don't know. It's a good start on the, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't call this the coloring because I'm just using grays and black, but in a sense it is kind of, uh, you know, starting that process of coloring. Just not with color. <laughs> Towing, whatever. Okay. Okay, so, I don't know. I, I think the mood is starting to get established a little bit. Alright, so let's go back to the memento, London Fog, and let's start applying that into some of the sky. I, I'm not really sure if I'm going to use an image up there for that sky. I could. I could put this kind of sun down here, whatnot. I'm not sure if I want to just have some... I don't know, just some streaks or what, something like that. And the reason why, I mean, I could put something up there, but I'm just, uh, the thing that's going kind of around in my head is I'm just wondering if it's, um, with all these, you know, there's so much texture in this piece right here, I'm not quite sure if I want, you know, another object up there, or if I want it just kind of this amorphic thing to kind of bring more attention down here. I'm not really quite sure. Just kind of thinking out loud. I, I think it would both, it would work, and, you know, doing one thing or another is not going to be like, oh, you made a mistake. I'm just kind of wondering, I wonder what I would like better. Okay, so I'm switching back to this London Fog, and I do have some of that black still in this, so it's going to, you know, apply darker than um, what the London Fog is. But that's okay, because um, I plan on using a lot of this anyway. Okay. So I'll put plenty of it right along this kind of uh, water line. Some of it will need to go in the trees as well, even though I am going to color the trees quite a bit. So we're, I'm just kind of establishing, yeah, I don't know, kind of a semi-rough lighting scheme by controlling the darkness around in here. Or establishing some darker areas. Not really controlling it, kind of more defining it. Okay, so you define light through use of shade because we don't, we're not working with light in this piece itself. We're defining light through the use of shadow because we're just working on a white piece of paper and not using light bulbs or something like that. We're never working with actual light. It's only reflected light off this white of the paper. So if I tone in some areas and I leave some of that white of that paper, the lightness of it, it will then represent light. And it looks like light. coming around down here. It's a little streaky and uh, kind of varied. I'm not really, I didn't have this concept right here. I'm just kind of seeing what develops and kind of just being careful not to tone everything out and to um, 
retain some of that variation. Of variation of light and dark, that is, by leaving some areas light. Okay, let's move on to the next value of gray, although, I don't know, this gray might not be as dark as that gray that was mixed with black, but here comes another layer here. One of the things, I, I'm not going to start coloring this in, but it would have been easier to start coloring this in right now, but I think I'll wait. And it's easier now because it's wet, so when I start applying things like blue on here or whatnot. But, I don't know, I have a lot of considerations on this gigantic piece of kind of what color scheme do I want to go with and kind of what mood, you know, the time of day and things like that. It's kind of already getting to kind of more of a, kind of a darker tinge at least, I guess. I mean, I could still kind of really warm things up in here, you know, with, you know, some brighter colors in the sky and whatnot, but, um, I don't know, I think I want things kind of like hauntingly beautiful, you know, with some, some darker tinges and kind of uh, establish a, you know, a certain type of a uh, mood. All right, that is the water area. Let's go to black now and start establishing it. Kind of some darker tone. Now, this area in here, I, I need to go into my trees as well, but like I said, I'll kind of figure these things out as I'm going along here. So things might get darker. Once you make things dark, you can't necessarily make them lighter, but you can, if you don't like something or something gets too dark, and you have some area around it, you can make the area around it darker, and the thing that went too dark for you will seem lighter by contrast. I'm starting to pick up some fingerprints. I don't know if I touch some something. I was eating fries earlier, but I thought I washed my hands. Is that a little smooth gradation? A lot of ink on the surface and using the side of my stylus tool in a very light touch. and just kind of going with repetition of that same movement in the same area. It's kind of like pulling that tone across in some ways. You're not really pulling it across, but you're just kind of extending the streak, but it's kind of like a, that's what the, the feeling of that is. Okay, how's that look, you know, for our water down here, we have this kind of lighting coming in here and lighting over here. And I think the trees would be casting more of a shadow, so let's make that a little bit darker too. But, kind of start to see it, kind of, uh, the lighting within this uh, composition starting to take place. And kind of, uh, the lighting scheme, you might say.
Okay. There we have it. I haven't done my sky yet. <laughs> so it's just basically a three-step process, but um, I know everything has to get kind of a, you know, um, incorporated in with this kind of this general lighting scheme, but I don't know, I'm kind of filling in the, you know, those areas of, uh, vast areas of, um, blank space right now. But I like what I see. Um, yeah, I can't wait to kind of render this, um, um, rocky ledge here and, uh, kind of bring it together. Yeah, just, uh, bring it together in terms of, um, I don't know, just values and kind of breaking it up a little bit in terms of space, too. And, uh, kind of establishing some light and shade like this area, you know. I don't know, I'm just testing it out right there. What I want to do is I want to oscillate this between light and dark, you know, like shadows would be um, out of nature. You want to uh, kind of establish, we've established the, uh, the shadows underneath all these different objects in here. So you need to do the same for um, all of your areas when you do things like that, just for continuity, it, it, just in terms of lighting, yeah. It just, it brings things together and it just, it, um, it unifies things in terms of um, saying that, you know, visually that light is hitting certain things in certain ways. So it's not like, you know, we have like it's a gigantic spotlight over everything. You know, there's kind of a light source and um, certain things are being lit. Anyways, I'm kind of starting to come into this. I couldn't resist. I just wanted to kind of break this up a little bit. Okay, but what I would do want, you know, I do want is um, some variation in here. So, you know, if you just kind of oscillate this with some light and darks in certain areas, um, it will have a kind of a richer overall appearance in terms of value, okay? Value is the relative light and dark of a given object or space. And if you vary it, what you're doing is you're just extending the range of your piece out. And uh, I used to be kind of into contrast. I liked having a really wide range. And I, sometimes I, I, I was really drawn to things without too much of the mid-tones, but uh, I'm kind of into the mid-tones now. In other words, I liked high contrast. That's really dark and white, basically. Black and white. Um, but I really appreciate the grays now. Kind of the mid-range. So I like the con you know, the you know, the, uh, the range, but I, I do like all the, uh, kind of the variations within the middle here. So anyways, what I'm doing is I'm putting some, uh, shadows underneath some of these trees right here. Let's see this, doing things like this, and then leaving some areas lighter like that, it just, it just, uh, I don't know, it just varies things in here. I, I'm using that word over and over again, but I can't think of another word to say. Rather than just kind of treating this whole thing as, you know, one uniform thing that's completely flat, you know. So, and then there could be, you know, um, clouds up in the sky that are varied, you know, so you have light coming through it in certain areas. You know, if you look across the landscape or whatnot, you know, I mean, chances are there's going to be variation, you know, you can see it changing, you know, some clouds going across and, it, you know, it might be slow, but there's things that are varied on the ground, so 
lot of times when people look at um, kind of a given space, sky, water, a certain rock, they feel inclined to um, color, color that area, that whole area in uniformly instead of varying it. I would generally say for most things, if you just kind of oscillate things a little bit more, um, I don't know, I, I think it, you'll like it just in general. And things look a little bit more dimensional that way, okay? So, that's kind of happening to this hillside. It's like light is hitting it in a certain area. I mean, it doesn't have to be so direct. You don't have to kind of analyze and say, okay, if light is here, then what rock in here would be lighter? All you just do is you just vary it, you know, which looks like lighting on a given object. Okay. So in other words, just do less coloring than total coloring. One of my kind of most memorable hikes. I used to do this thing called like a peak bagging. It's when you bag a peak, you've climbed up to the top of some peak somewhere and you know, you can pretty much like check it off your list. Either a real list or, you know, just, I don't know, kind of a mental, you know, mental one, you know, you've completed the thing that, you know, Nothing hardcore, but um, sometimes, you know, quite a few miles in elevation gain. But um, one of my favorite hikes that I did was a really easy one, you know, in terms of, uh, I don't know, time commitment, distance, and everything like that. And that's one of the hikes out in um, Acadia National Park, and it's the... Um, the uh, Precipice Trail. I almost forgot it. <laughs> and that's where you... It's this trail that's been established. There's a lot of um, kind of handholds and bars along the side of this cliff and old railing. And when I was out there, I don't know, what was it? 15 years ago. <laughs> I swore that when I was on those... Um, that trail, some of those bars were probably some of the original ones that were installed. Probably not, but I didn't see a bunch of holes in the rock, you know, from, like, old ones there. But some of these bars were, like, all rusted and bent and stuff. It kind of added to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the experience. But, um, you know, there was a lot of exposure in terms of um, kind of looking off ledges. And, you know, some areas are, I don't know, foot wide on the ledge and, you know, you're looking down, plunging, not too high, it was probably like, I don't know, high enough though, so it wasn't like looking down like thousands of feet, but, you know, a few hundred feet, you know, if you fell off, and there's been deaths up there before when people tried to do that in uh, the winter and it was icy, I think, in fact, the, the summer that I was out there, or it might have been fall, well, it was fall with all that color, um, I guess someone died out there in the uh, previous winter they did this trail, which is not a good idea in that uh, ledge situation. Anyways, but what I'm getting at here was um, one of the ledges, you always had a handhold to hold on to, like a bar, you know, a metal bar, but one area it kind of ended and, you know, I don't know, maybe four or five feet away was, you know, the next bar. Which would have been fine for me, except the only thing on that ledge was, um, right at that point, the ledge was kind of sloped, and there was like, it was like water dripping down, so it was like, kind of had algae on it, and it was like slick. And it just took me like one step to get over it, but it was, you know, I'm looking down, and I was kind of used to heights at that time, of doing a lot of, uh, forays out into, uh, the boulder piles out in Joshua Tree um, for year, you know, many, many, or not, you know, four A's into that, but um, I don't know, it was a little bit hairy, yeah, I was a little scared. <laughs>
I was scared of slipping. I wasn't really scared from the height, but um, it, uh, it was definitely an experience. Anyways, I'm thinking about that when I see this right here. It was like I can see this like this trail coming around, you know. All right, so do you see this where it's kind of varied in here? There's like lights and darks in there. Retain those lights in there, like that, in some areas, and you'll be happier than coloring the whole thing in. And you're doing less work, too, right? Okay, so... This area could use a little bit more. Okay, let me add a little bit of shadows into my trees here. I'm kind of adding them underneath the trees, like in, underneath the canopy, but I'm not toning in everything, okay? I just figured these trees wouldn't be, like, too front lit, although I do want them to stand out quite a bit, though. And here, I put shadows down there so um, so that area underneath the canopy isn't so light in value. Kind of makes the tree stand out a little bit more. It makes the area a little bit more dimensional. here between this ledge in this water area was dark so I made this ledge area light if some ledge you know some there's some water area that's really light I would probably make ledge dark just to contrast against it so that we're kind of oscillating a little bit more it's kind of like they call checkerboarding if you're checkerboarding your piece between light dark light dark light dark okay okay so I think it's time to do our sky area up here. Let's go back to that London fog for my grayscale. Not this piece isn't going even black and white, um, but we're just kind of establishing that general lighting scheme in the piece. Okay. on which we can apply our colors later, our color scheme and all that good stuff. Okay, so just kind of applying that gentle tone in there, it's very light. Sometimes I get a big puddle of ink kind of established, then I'll just kind of streak it in like that. It's, that's what would, that's what's nice about reinkers is that you have so much ink on here, so it would make things a little bit faster, but you can also just kind of put a puddle down there and just kind of drag it out. Okay, 
kind of adding some of these little interior streaks. Just kind of vary it somewhat, or a lot. I usually work from the outside edge in, but and here I need to work a little bit in to end out, just because there's so much space here. it's varied enough. London Fog. I might be done with that. It did a great job. Let's go over to the gray Marvy. You notice how I have the page turned. I'm not always working on it right side up. It's because this is a very conducive angle for my natural motion of my hand to do that stroke. Okay, so you always turn your card in a direction that's the most conducive and ergonomic to the motion that you're utilizing. Okay? Save your hands and your joints and, you know, I don't know. You'll, your shoulder won't get tired and tense. Just keep everything nice and loose, okay? And you'll feel it if you're kind of using um, your tools in a repetitive motion in the wrong direction, or in a direction that's not the most conducive to uh, a nice kind of graceful streak and a nice <laughs> kind of direction for the health of your, I don't know, your joints and muscles and everything like that. Alright, so there we have that. It's kind of this hazy, atmospheric um, kind of look that we've uh, established here, huh? With the gray. I do like gray, but I don't want to do this one in like a black and white. I want, I want some color in there. Trying to vary it a little bit more. See, I'm kind of going with these two streaks right here. I'm staying in that area longer so I can kind of come over here more. I'm not doing it, trying to get it in one stroke. I'm doing it in multiples. It just kind of keeps that, kind of keeping that dragging motion. leaving some space up there for some color as well.
Okay, this is this is going quite a bit faster than I thought. Okay, just kind of redefining those shadows, or not redefining, but um, kind of ex extending these shadows, adding some darker areas to those areas that I've toned with the gray, but try to vary it though. I'm not just putting it exactly over the exact spot that I did with the, in the gray tones. I'm just kind of maybe at the bottom sides of some of these rocks, bottom edge, I'll add more tone where it looks like it's even darker in an area. So right in here, and I can kind of see I have this on its edge again. You can kind of render things a little bit more, the more close up they are, you know, there can be more variation in something than something really far away where you can't get too, too detailed. So, I'm spending a little more time on this area. It's an important area, there's just a ton of it, so. somewhere. Now, when I said I, I want variation on this, I don't want it just so varied that it's turned into pattern again, just dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light, okay? We might want, you know, want to go bold in some areas, you know, just to, I don't know, just to create an overall variation in, in, the, uh, in the piece, okay, so maybe like right up here, I'll give us a darker kind of ledge, edge, <laughs> the ledge, edge to ledge right here. Because I think those trees down below are going to be nice and I don't know, colorful. So let's go over that a little bit, and we'll just say that you know, kind of a a cloud is coming over this way and making this area a little bit darker. 
Oh, I don't want to go too dark here because that's where the dark meets light. So I'll do this right here. We'll oscillate it. It's interesting, there's so much ink right here that I just kind of put a streak in there. Kind of a harder streak in it. It kind of almost like removed ink. In fact, I think it did. I had so much of the foundation gray down there, I guess. Yeah, it's like digging into that uh, top layer ink of the, the black and uh, removing it a little bit. It's kind of interesting. It gives it kind of a, I don't know, a little bit of a alcohol ink or watercolory type of look. scale in here. Some trees down here, maybe. Some of them. Keep them kind of bright overall, or light overall. All right, I think we have a pretty good foundation here for some color to come. I don't know, we'll do something up here browns, purple, I don't know. Maybe I can bring in some color in here too, some fall colors. What I like about um, those fall colors is um, it reflects in the foliage, like not just trees, which we tend to think about, but like bushes and uh, like ground cover and whatnot. So kind of going with color here is really uh, going to afford me the, uh, the ability to um, add in other types of um, color schemes in here that um, might look kind of nice. So anyways, I think that's all I'm going to be doing for this segment right here. I'm looking at the time on my camera here. It looks like the kind of the entire lighting scheme process here took about an hour or so. Um, I don't know, a lot of other considerations to make here, but a lot of the, uh, the hardest work is done in terms of uh, just kind of establishing, and it wasn't too hard, just had to lay down enough of that first color of ink and then kind of you know, doing these wispy things. I can really see the uh, kind of the arc of my hand when I'm doing that, you know, whereas on a quarter page card, there's not so much area to fill in, you know, it's like little hatching, but I can tell that some of these are kind of like bent, you know, as far as my strokes go. It's a little bit more of a, I don't know, hand of the artist type of thing, you know, kind of showing on such a large scale um, piece here in terms of being able to see the brush strokes themselves, so. All right, so another step done, and I look forward to doing some coloring the next time around. Okay, time to get back to this scene here. I've been so busy this past week, I've been working kind of off and on on this, and it'd be better just to uh, kind of continue working on it when I do. Not when the, uh, everything was wet, but uh, at least the coloring process, just because the pulp of the paper gets a little bit moist when you're working on it, and, um, you know, when you use the, uh, the uh, additional inks that you're laying on top of, you know, them, one over the other, it's just, it's just so much easier to uh, apply them when the, uh, the pulp of the paper is a little bit super saturated so that um, the inks kind of glide across the paper. And, um, 
you can extend um, your application of that given ink um, farther, you know, across in uh, a given stroke. But that being said, I don't know, maybe this will um, allow us for uh, some different opportunities, maybe with some of the ink set in there, some of these textures like this in here, maybe they'll be a little bit more set and uh, they won't go back into solution as easy, you know, as if you go across it with, um, you know, when they're wet or moist with another wet ink, you know, we might lose some of those kind of uh, nice uh, textures that are, have been kind of been formed um, and allowed to set. So anyways, that being said, um, <laughs> I need to be getting to some inventory issues, but um, I wanted to get back to this scene. I've been itching to uh, start um, kind of resolving some of the uh, color uh, considerations that um, we can that we're, we've been afforded working on this size here. So um, there's all kinds of different color schemes that I can utilize on this. Um, but I thought we'd just go with some, I don't know, pretty straightforward types of things. They call it local color. I'll try to kind of um, harmonize things a little bit more, but local color is just doing things, you know. If, uh, you know, the, the strongest association with water is blue, we do that blue. You know, these trees in here, um, if they're fall colors, we do them fall colors. But we'll add some richness to them with some undertones, though as well, or as needed. Okay, so, um, this, again, is a really large piece here, so re-inkers would be a really good thing to utilize on here. I didn't utilize that with the, uh, the, the gray tones that I laid down because I didn't have a re-inker for my Memento, London Fog. I don't have too many gray tones. Um, I need to look and see what's out there, um, what's available out there. As far as that goes, there's more, a lot more color in the uh, stamping industry than there are um, like variations of gray, like a warm gray or a cool gray. Most of them are kind of neutral. And that's because if they had a bunch of grays for sale, I, I just don't know if people would buy them or not. Um, when I used to sell Marvy pads um, back in the day, we, we, we bar I barely... Um, reordered uh, gray. Everyone would go for color because color, you know, kind of a, it has more of an emotional impact type of thing and draw, so um, I don't know how, how popular, I don't know, maybe eight versions of gray would be, you know, maybe from like a light, a couple medium tones and a darker gray, uh, and a warm gray, and uh, maybe then one neutral one, like a 50% neutral, and uh, I don't know, maybe a cool gray or something like that, well, you know, would do. Um, I would utilize it if anyone ever came out with it or if it exists, but um, I don't know. I, I guess I still wouldn't use it as much as a lot of the colors that I'm using, so. Okay, so um, I happen to have an aqua re-inker, okay? This one's really good blue, light blue, because it's so light. They're no longer sold Adirondack lights, okay, aqua, but an excellent choice that's still around would be your Memento Summer Sky. I don't want to tilt that too much. I have some ringer fluid here, but um, that would be an excellent one to go with. And I would use that uh, a Summer Sky if I had it. I don't have a ringer for that one. I do have the pad, which I might use a little bit, but um, this uh, Aqua will is the lightest thing that I happen to have and in ringer format. So. Just re-inkers, I don't have to keep dabbing into my pad as often and going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth like that and applying very little color, you know. I, I, although, I don't know, if you have a really juicy pad, you can get a decent amount on there, but, um, um, you know, when you ink up with a um, re-inker into a sponge applicator such as this one, you're basically turning this applicator, this sponge tip, into a ink pad on a stick, you know, in many ways, so it's just a really quick way to apply a lot of color, and even if it, it's on a quarter page scene, I mean, I still use um, re-inkers for 
um, starting off my scenes quite often, unless I have just a very little area that I'm going to be using, something like a blue. Um, but I used to have all my students start off with um, re-inkers when I finally got around to figuring that out. Um, and it made things so much easier for people. And they can also get a feel for how much ink, at least in this process right here of dye-based inks on uh, glossy cardstock, they should use. Everyone's so used to using um, a given amount of ink applied to color something fully. But we're doing more than that um, with this ink here. We are kind of saturating the page um, quite a bit. Okay. And, um, at, you know, as well as coloring. Okay, so that being said, we've retained, I'm re trying to retain by not going over it too much, this lighter area in here, because we've established our lights and darks. So here's the light area in here. I mean, I could fill that in. This is not a very dark blue at all. It's barely visible. It's just kind of tinting ever so slightly. Um, wherever I'm applying it with a little bit of that hue. The hue is blue and the value is very light, okay? So I'm not applying to, I mean, I could go over it, but I would lose my, you know, that white light. And I do want some white light in here, meaning I have to retain some of that white of the paper in order to give the impression that white light is being cast in here. And that's because I have some white um, embellishments that I want to add in the form of like some mist or fog, and that would be done with a white pigment ink. So if I've taken away all the white in here, we're saying that no white is being cast, no white light is being um, cast in here. So I will be careful to re retain that. Okay, so going into the sky now. And again, we have that kind of horizon kind of glow with that lighter area where that didn't fill it in with the, the black and the gray, so just be careful to retain a lot of that. I am going into some of that white, though. I'm taking out some of it, but just retain some of it, though. All right, so that was a good slathering of that ink. Let me get some of those last little bits out of here. Yeah, actually, there's more on this brush than I thought. When I do that, it really squeezes out. Okay, it's just like it's just like what I thought. I I'm retaining some of these um, textures in there, and I don't know. Maybe that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the uh, the fact that I let this sit and dry for a couple days. I'm not recommending that. I mean, I'm sure that you're, uh, you know, we're all eager. And if I wasn't busy this last week. Um, I would have gotten to this. In fact, I might have just colored this all in one sitting. All right, so there's that blue tinge. I, I don't know, I hope you can kind of tell the difference. See, there's that bluish tinge in there, and here's just the gray here. Can you see, can, can you see a little bit of that uh, cooler tone over here? It's really very light, so a lot of times when people start using this type of thing, like a color that light, don't start scrubbing it harder and harder, thinking, oh, okay, I'm not applying any of that color, so I need to scrub it harder, and then, you know, you end up ripping your tip there, okay? If you're applying a very light color, it's not going to get dark. You'll just achieve a full saturation with that given value that you're working with, okay? Now, that being said, you do want it to achieve, especially in these lighter tones, you know, kind of a full saturation with that given um, uh, tone kind of before you move on. All right, now, just so we don't, you heard me say this all the time in uh, other uh, videos if you've watched them, but um, I like to give continuity. I don't like to just have a certain color in one area and then another color in another area without having a little bit of crossover. So what I'll do is I'll bring some of this um, blue into my other areas, like down here in this grass underneath the... Uh, full foliage. Um, I'll put some of this down in here. I'll put some on these rocks in here, maybe in the shadows or whatnot, just so that it's not just a completely foreign hue within a different space in the scene, okay? <clears throat> I 
I, I'm sitting here, and I can barely see it myself, you know. I know it's down there, because I can see these balls, you know, these beads of, you know, ink on the paper. It's, this is the shadow stamping blue right now, so it's very, very light. If you happen to be using something like um, the summer sky, it's going to be a little bit darker, and you'll be able to notice the hue much more apparently. Um, but it won't be too dark, so don't, don't expect this summer sky to look like, you know, something like a Bahama blue. You know, I can put a million, you know, applications of this onto here, and it's not going to get any darker than that one, okay? So don't expect that one to get to that one. We get to that one by utilizing that one on our, on our scene. You know, that's the darkness. I'm saying this to, to uh, kind of like beginning stampers, you know, that see kind of an end result and they, you know, they think, I, I notice it, it, it and it's completely uh, understandable because most of us in, you know, most forms of stamping, we're not layering ink over ink over ink. So we're saying most people say, okay, I'm going to color that red and they'll use one red over it, you know, and then that's it pretty much. You might do a little bit of texturing or something like that, but I'm talking about beginning stamper, not experienced stampers that are doing, you know, all kinds of things with layered, you know, um, uh, alcohol inks and, uh, you know, and, uh, what is that, um, I don't know, well, I forget that other type of ink that's out there. It's not pigment inks, but, um, oh, I don't know, there's, there's just different types that you get all kinds of different textures from and whatnot. But for those new to, you know, um, kind of, you know, the concept of layered color, um, it's kind of a strange notion to kind of build up to it, you know, because I just haven't done that before. But that being said, we're doing that because we get kind of a, a, a much richer end result by the, you know, the addition of additional um, inks on top of one another. And dye base inks are all transparent, so the undercoats will always show through. Like for example, I'm taking this blue. This one's a salvia blue over the top of gray, right? But it's not opaque where we can't see our gray, so it's just kind of tinting things, and uh, that's what's happening with um, um, dye base inks. It's tinting the paper that we're working on. Okay. Now I have a lot of that other blue on here too, so. And when I'm applying this other color, and this will be the same for all inks that I use, the previous color, unless I change colors and I change tips here, but the previous color will always be on here. So it's kind of when you switch over to the next color, by not um, cleaning this off, you'll get some kind of fusion <clears throat> of those two colors together. Which is good, because it helps in the transition process. Now this one right here, I'm wishing it did apply a little bit faster, because I can barely see it change, you know, in there. Okay. I don't know, can you see the difference now between this blue and that up there? It just looks gray, right? So this one's, it's just a little bit darker, and I like working that way. I like working just a little bit darker at any given time. I don't like doing these vast, you know, dramatic, uh, calligraphic or some, you know, brush calligraphy movements with, uh, you know, applications with this type of ink. I like things just to kind of build up gradually. Uh, it gives me a lot of control over how much has been applied how smoothly it applies, and it just makes the entire um, application process so much easier and basically foolproof, okay? And I say that because it really is, in terms of <clears throat> the blending process, I mean, I could use the worst technique possible. See, if I put that on a dry piece of paper, and this is just, you know, matte paper, it's fixed right there, right? But now, because this page is fairly wet, and I use the reinker, if I do this on here, right, I can just see that right there. See that just blends right out. It's like sweeping it out. Now I did apply a little bit of it down there, but um, 
you see how easy it just blends in. It's like, it's almost like <clears throat> I'm applying this ink on glass or something like that. When you kind of super saturate a little bit. Okay, I'm putting some of this into my grassy area. And putting it kind of in the shadow area. Kind of using a little choppy and side of my brush type of motion like that. Ah, this is a really big scene. It's really kind of fun though. It's <laughs> I feel kind of looser in in a way. I guess it's because you know I'm normally lurking like this, like this big, so it's like this, you know. But there's kind of a like a painting type of quality, you know, painting on canvas when you're working this large. It's I don't know. I'm use I, maybe I'm use, utilizing like a more of my body and my arms, I guess, my shoulders. It's not a workout or anything like that. I'm just kind of extending out and, you know, coming coming back here. Do leave things um, nice and ergonomic, and that's why I do rotate my page, even though it's really big. You know, if I want to apply some ink here, it's easier for me to do this. My hand just kind of naturally goes like this, falls like this, right? So if I'm doing this and I'm trying to come over here, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, you know, at a bad angle for that. I mean, I could just switch this like this too. It's no, not really a big deal. But over the course of a you know a large scene like this, or even if it's a small scene that I'm working on, I do like to change the uh, the angle of my uh, surface rather than kind of working out of my kind of range of effectiveness. Um, if, you know, leaving uh, the scene right side up. Okay. Okay. So I'm just switching around. Come up here. All right. So a little bit bluer. Not a whole lot, though, huh? Oops. Now this is where I kind of start to lose some of my options. I wish I had kind of a bluish gray tone, maybe. I don't have that distressing tumbled glass, is it? That blue one? Although it doesn't look like too blue-gray. I could use like a, like a blue-gray in here or something like that. Like a, I don't know, lighter, cool gray, kind of more in the bluish tinge. And that would be perfect for in here to set that mood. Let's just go with the Bahama Blue. Bahama Blue looks a little bit cheery. Let's see what it looks like over the top of this gray um, scale foundation, though. Okay, actually, this isn't too bad. <laughs> it's because barely any of it is coming out. This is what this blue looks like right here. All right, but applying it over the tops of all these colors, hardly anything's coming off. You know, because it is like stamping onto like wet, you know, like glass or something like that. It hardly have any of it is applying. I can kind of tap it down there, and it kind of shows up. But it's really quite, I don't know, quite a subtle change right now. I. It's from that re-anchor that I used. I, I really super saturated this pulp of this paper. Now, if you have, if you have the type of paper that I'm recommending these days, um, this is a ten-point thickness right here. If you have a twelve-point, it's going to have more pulp. So all of your ink won't super saturate as fast. Maybe I super saturated too, you know, too much. Well, I guess you know the very nature. Maybe I saturated too much. Super saturated means it can't just can't take any more, right? So uh, maybe that is the case, like over here in the corner. None of it's applying, but you can see that streak in here where there's. I went into that little, you know, area where there's less ink applied in there, so you can see my 
application of it a little bit easier. Okay, so coming in here, this looks pretty good. I, I, do, I do like this color scheme that we're kind of developing here with this blue. It looks pretty good over that gray, I would think. Nice. With that blue. Actually, it's not too bad. Maybe that, maybe that does look good. Just as is, you know. In my mind, I was thinking a little bit more bluish, but um, eh, that kind of little shimmer of that blue hue in the lighter areas is actually kind of nice. has a nice radiance, I think, doing that, coming over that gray scale. Like I said, I don't work with that gray scale foundation too much. Usually if I'm going for these streaky things, I might use black kind of as my last color, but I used it first this time just to kind of expedite the entire process of coloring here, so I don't have to, you know, kind of consider, um, you know, my shadows as much or at all, now that I've already done that with um, the gray, so it's kind of nice just going in here and just kind of color tinting the scene. Boy, that is really saturated, look at that. So I put it down on this rock right here. Okay, and I see a lot of blue, but then when I just go like that, I can just kind of wipe it right off. Again, that's the reinker that's already been kind of established. So if anyone ever tells me, and they tell me it all the time, I just have to kind of remind them. Um, if they're getting kind of these oval shapes everywhere on their scene like that, and it doesn't come off, it's because, and it doesn't spread in, it's because there's not enough of that first color, first one or two colors, you know. So that when they do do something like that, if it's on a dry piece of paper, it just sticks. But if you do that here, I can really squeeze in some color like that, right? I can squeeze it all out. I'm pressing into that paper, but watch this. It just wipes right in. Or wipes right out, I should say. Okay, so there we have it. There's, uh, what was that Bahama blue that I'm using? Even remember what color I used. Because when the paper is so wet, too, you're not applying that much ink because it's not absorbing in there as fast. So, one kind of inking it, of it, of your applicator, really goes quite a long ways. Okay. I guess it's, it's really allowing me these colors to go quite far with my applications. Let's try the blue by Marvy. <laughs> yeah, okay. It is really getting saturated. I can barely see it. <clears throat> it's a little bit darker, though. But boy, I tell you, I can really come over here into lighter area with this darker blue because it just, it's so nicely saturated. The paper it is really spreading around. If I want to go darker, though, it's not great because it's not transferring onto the paper very quickly at all really resisting it, but the blending is beautiful. It is so easy to just glide this across. I, don't know, I, I didn't think I used that much 
of that ring or fluid, you know, in relation to how much I use on a quarter page. You know, it, it seemed like I only used like, I don't know, maybe three times as much, but this thing is like, I was like one, uh, was it eight times as large as a quarter page. see my fingerprints in here. I must have had oily fingers or something. Okay. <laughs> this big scene cracks me up. <clears throat> At this point in time, it doesn't feel too much different than um, working on a, a quarter page scene. It's just, I don't know, my, I'm probably, you know, I'm making a, uh, what is that? I don't know, it's like a six inch swipe here instead of a, like a one inch one, you know, that I'd be doing on a, you know, small piece of paper. I don't know, it doesn't feel too different though. When I, when I, the, the notion of it, um, doing a, you know, really large, uh, you know, tabloid size, uh, piece, size wise, um, was more kind of daunting than the actual application of it, um, actual application of the media to it, I, I, I feel. Like right here, I'm kind of pulling this and I'm coming one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, like that. If it was a quarter page scene, I'd be going like this. And that would, you know, that would be it in terms of my movement towards, you know, towards center. some shadows down with this darker tone and a darker area. I've already kind of established a um, kind of a light shadow or a black one. But just going and reiterating it with this now blue. This is Prussian blue by the way and the other darker Marvy that I was using I think I forgot to mention was just called blue. It's the number three blue. This one Prussian blue is, is really, really dark, but man, it, this is really acting differently with uh, all of that uh, foundation coat of that aqua. It's just not getting very dark. But dark enough and adequately. Let's, uh, 
Pretty good. We're getting that gray gray scale kind of uh, blue, or that um, kind of steel blue um, hue. So what was that? That must have been about was it four layers of blue. Um, aqua, salvia, Bahama blue, blue, Prussian blue. Okay, that's six blues right there. I have Caribbean blue, but I don't think I want to do that. blue. I don't think it'd be good with a, with a scene. It might look okay. I mean, it might warm it up a little bit, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of Maine here, so, and Acadia, and uh, it was not that, you know, tropical there <laughs> when I was there. Okay, so, we've got our blues established in there. I don't know, I can add a little bit more here and there. You know, just for a little bit of continuity, having a little bit of that blue kind of shimmering up in the mountains as well, or the hill, mountains, mountain. Um, just to give that continuity, I want to create a relationship between all the different areas, so having a little tinge of um, kind of common hue is a uh, it's fairly important for that, as far as that goes. And I think we're ready for some color, so we'll add in some nice splashes of color throughout the piece. We're afforded um, kind of a wide range of hue um, due to the uh, the um, the theme of this and the, the fall foliage in here that we can achieve. Um, I was looking at the photograph that I took, and... Uh, I don't know, I guess in my mind I was thinking much more kind of reds and oranges, which were there when I was in Acadia, but um, it was much more yellow. Um, there were a lot more yellows, um, and there were a lot more pine trees, just vast areas of just the pine, as, you know, instead of the deciduous. So I was thinking I was almost getting too many pines up here, but when I saw that photograph, there was just a vast area without any color at all, and it was just because they were all pines, you know, so... Uh, maybe I can add, you know, a few more pines, you know, in here in the form of uh, the, uh, you know, this one right here, the, uh, the pine dew. I might add that later on, um, but I think I'm going to let this dry now, okay? Not that if I put my hand there, it's going to get all over me, um, but I'll, I will go for a, a, a hue change now. Maybe we'll do a little bit more of the browns and tans, and I'll use some distress inks and whatnot in here. And I did want to bring in some, like, pops of color, you know, and some um, foliage in here, maybe stamped in, like, a crimson red or something like that, because it does get this deep, vibrant, um, kind of medium, darker tone red in uh, some scenes. And I, I think I want to reference some books as well, so I'll take a look at that and uh, kind of get a feel for the overall color scheme. Like, definitely in the trees down below, but... Also, along this hillside, on this kind of this more barren rock type of thing, it's not really that barren, it's full, but um, we do have some kind of more open areas, you know, that are, you know, that has less, you know, there's less soil up here than um, kind of the, uh, the more uh, lower um, elevation trees, you know, the waterline uh, level trees and whatnot, so... Something to do there, and a lot to consider, and... Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be pretty much uh, 
you know, kind of do whatever um, up here in terms of the color schemes that we can apply because there's all kinds of things like lichen too that um, are all up here that I don't know. I can't wait to get to like some gel pens up here and everything like that too. So I don't know. Nice big splashes of color, but we'll also maybe do some under tinting tones in here as well to kind of bring everything together as well. So I'll have to kind of figure that out at that time. Okay, back for another session on this big gigantic piece. I was looking at um, some books that I uh, often love for inspiration and uh, take a look at this scene right here. Uh, well, not scene, but uh, photograph. And this is in, taken in Acadia National Park, but look at the beautiful colors here and um, kind of the, just the variation that can be found. And these are the types of kind of inspirational um, uh, photographs that I've referenced to design things like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the boulders with lichen and trying to get that type of uh, texturing and uh, just that um, kind of spirit of that texture and uh, I don't know, surface into images like this and uh, bringing that um, kind of, a, I don't know, whatever you call it, flavor or whatnot to the uh, texturing of the, the rock. So absent that type of thing, it's just kind of an outline, so you have to kind of bring that into it. But that leaves all kinds of um, things up to the stamper to um, kind of interpret and to bring whatever spirit they want into it. And that's where all the creativity comes in. <laughs> but look at this color right here. This color right there, I mean, if we're just kind of thinking of something, as opposed to making it visual, I, I don't know that we would think to color a rock like this green, right? But I mean, this doesn't look out of the ordinary when we see it in this type of, uh, you know, photographic uh, context, okay? But it, I mean, that color is really close to this right here. This is yellow-green. Now, I wouldn't color in an entire piece like that because the whole thing is not colored that color, but you can see where it's, you know how I always try to bring certain colors into the piece and, uh, bring it um, and introduce it throughout the piece in some value of this color. Well, you have it here in the background and you, you know, over here it's a little bit less, here it's kind of spotty and, you know, this foreground rock right here is really covered and almost glowing with that color. But look at that red there, it's like that crimson red um, bush back there. So, how to do that type of thing, and then of course this kind of straw-looking um, grass, uh, that fall-colored grass in there with that kind of oranges and ochres and, um, I, I don't know, that uh, variation in there that's happening in that. But, boy, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if we think about these types of combinations, you know, without looking at a, a book like this, or a photograph of this, I should say. But, um, I don't know, those are the types of things that we can bring into the scene, and it seems like it would be a lot of fun, but it's like, well, okay, well, how do you do that? And I ask myself that, you know, that's that same question, too, when um, kind of approaching something like this. You don't want to have it so kind of uh, consistent throughout this, and you know, just, okay, that's green, that's red, that's green, uh, that's orange right there, and something like that, and it kind of all has to um, harmonize with each other. Okay, that being said, though, all right, this is my approach to that kind of spirit, all right? Now, we've already achieved um, a good uh, foundation value scheme in here, okay? And things are looking reasonably harmonious, for lack of a better word, um, through the use of grayscale, okay? We've kind of given everything a lighting scheme and um, kind of gotten our, our shadows and things like that established. And the shadows are the things that are establishing 
um, the lighting in here through the retention of that lighter, you know, white paper that we're working on here. Okay, but to bring all these other colors into um, areas in here that are going to be kind of of a warmer temperature. Now I've already established some kind of cooler temperatures in here, but if you go light enough with kind of a warm temperature, you can layer that right over some cool areas or into the cool areas where it's not going to look um, like it's clashing, okay? Now these blues in here are fairly light as well. So I, wouldn't, I don't know if I would go with a navy blue or something like that in a, you know, orange yellow or something like that. It would really kind of look out of place, but if you bring in kind of the very lightest tones of those two types of colors, like say in the spirit of, you know, that uh, like the summer sky and like an antique linen or something like that, you know, some kind of warm hue, okay? Those should go just fine. So again, that's just all to say that um, kind of it's, it's really a safe kind of a, approach to start things with really light um, colors and then to work into the darker ones. Now I know I did work in with grays and blues, but that wasn't really coloring though. That was just your gray scale and then when you introduce hue into it in the form of some colors. Um, I find it easier just to start with some light ones, especially if I don't really have a good <laughs> um, kind of handle on um, what different color combinations as far as the inks that I happen to have will work on here. And I'm thinking about bringing in a lot of different ones into this one. If I'm just going like monochromatic or something like that or monotonal, um, that's different. That's really easy because I'm just kind of just working through a range of values through one hue, like all blue or something like that. If, you know, this was like a winter scene or something like that. But here, you know, we have like these distress inks, antique linen, old paper. There's some very light hues in here. Um, and I think they would work fine in, really in all aspects. I could bring this, you know, this old paper probably into some of these white areas too in my water, even though that sets kind of a different zone. It would kind of harmonize and give a nice base to this. Okay. Again, so that being said, if you can work light, work light. And if you're thinking about supplementing your ink pads, let's say you have some more brighter colors, you know, where normally maybe you wouldn't think about, you know, such light values of certain types of hue, um, maybe consider it because if you like this process here. I work a lot more with my lighter tones um, than I do my darker tones. I usually spend most of my time in the lighter to mid-tone ones, and the, the darker colors I do use, of course, but they're kind of more perimeter-oriented or in shadows, and I don't need as many of those because, you know, I don't use those. I use them more sparingly, you know, to hit the darkest areas because my lighter tones overlapped with, you know, several medium tones kind of form a darker uh, value inherently, and then I'll, you know, hit those darker ones later on, but they're a little bit more sparingly. Okay, that being said, I think I need, I might need, I'm going to some very light hue values here. Okay, that, I think I need to clean out, no, okay, let me see. I have some spare tips here. I've really done a lot of uh, um, inking lately. Let me get a light tip here. So all my tips are kind of... Uh, inky, even if they've been sitting around for like two weeks here or something like that, it's still kind of moist here, so these pads are really great in terms of their ink retention, but uh, I need to clean some out, but let me see, let me just switch out a couple tips here, this tip's getting pretty old here, this is probably, this is really old, it's getting a little um, crispy as like really old foam does. All right, so I have a couple tips ready to go here. All right, now ideally I'd have a re-inker for this as well, some of these really light ones. I don't have re-inkers for any of my distress inks yet. 
I need to get around to doing that. Um, I'm not even sure if some of these pads are dry or not, but we shall see. All right, now this is going to be a very undynamic segment of this video because this is a really light hue right here, okay? Light value of that hue. All right, so let me just zoom in here and see if I can't get some of this to read a little bit. This is so faint, okay? I can bear... I mean, I can see it, I mean, you know, for me right here. It's starting to change the, uh, the temperature a lot of these rocks, I can see. Um, where it overlaps in the blue, it's kind of changing that blue. See, I guess I, I guess you can see it. You see that difference between here and here. Well, that's what it is. It, it's barely visible, okay? But that's what you want, all right? Now, a lot of people when they they're used to coloring, and when they put a color down, when they apply something, they're used to most forms of stamping. You're used to seeing that color immediately, and then you color something in, and then it's completely colored, okay? But with this, it's kind of like laying down a very light tint of something, okay? It's like wood stain or something like that, maybe. If you're going with a really light stain, you kind of put it on, and it kind of makes the, the, the grain of the wood seem deeper and whatnot. That's, it's kind of more in the spirit of something like that. Think about it like, like you're just glazing something, you know, over a little bit. It's not really colored in deeply or anything like that, okay? And that's kind of what we're just going to keep doing. We're just going to keep layering um, this on. Okay, now I want to leave some white. I've kind of gotten rid of a lot of it, but I want to leave some white in case I want to add some of that pigment ink down on here. <clears throat> white pigment ink, okay? All right, so let's get some of this into the trees as well, all right? to the grass area down here. If I'm going to start, <clears throat> if I'm going to start working on 11 by 17s a little bit more, I think I need a bigger desk. I don't, but uh, I guess I need to just clean it off a little bit more. Getting some of that down in the water as well. If it's kind of a reflective um, surface, then you can get some of it down there. Alright, now in the water down here, okay? Let's warm up a little of that as well. Get kind of a change in temperature down in the lightest of areas, okay? You bring it into some of your, you know, transition it a little bit into your darker areas as well. You don't need to go over the whole thing though, but so that kind of warmer tinge in there kind of just gives it a little bit of a different spirit. Can you tell the difference between here and here? I didn't use any of it up there yet, but uh, it just has a little bit of a different feel to it. That's what's really great about these, um, some of these um, distress ink colors, okay? <laughs> I kind of, anytime it's so light that you can barely see it, I, I kind of worry that, um, you know, it's not going to be that practical of an ink for most usages, but for me it's perfect. So I always kind of worry, don't, you know, I, gosh, I hope they don't discontinue this. Like the, like the Adirondack lights, but they, they discontinued that entire line, though. Adirondacks and Adirondack lights, you know, too, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of people just aren't, you know, they're not stamping something out in this color, so, um, or in this light of a value most of the time, but it works perfectly for a layered color or a sub subsurface kind of a, a base layer um, color.
color and value. But again, this is a really um, kind of user-friendly process when you're working just so light. You know, it's just barely, but you know, darker than the white of the paper. But if you're doing things in this process and you're really kind of building things up, it is really difficult to make any kind of mistake. Watch this. I mean, that's like the worst possible technique anyone can possibly do, right? And it's not even visible anywhere. And it's because it's so light, okay? Now, I'm not going to do that with, you know, when I move into my darker tones, but it's just to make a point that you can, you know, start off with something really light. And if you're patient enough, a lot of people aren't patient enough, so they can barely see anything down. So they say, okay, I need to move my next color, where they didn't get kind of a good foundation of this going. And then they jump into the next one. And I understand that, you know, we want to see things and we want to see faster results. And we're used to seeing that in the form of using darker colors to color in some kind of outline design. Like a, It's more like a, you know, like a coloring book spirit where you're doing one color in one area. And that color has to count, you know. We want to be able to see it. But in this one right here, it's just so much easier. And that's how you get this kind of glowing... Um, kind of end result, I guess you, know, you can say. It's through these um, layered versions of a given hue. Okay, so I'll put in some grass down here. Maybe it'll be green, or maybe it'll be, I don't know, more of that golden color if this is fall, you know, and the trees are colored, you know. I don't know, I think I want some green down there, though. But anyways, this is going into old paper. I don't know, old paper might even be lighter than that uh, antique linen. I think they're about the same value, so it really didn't matter which one I went with first. But, um, okay, so, anyways, pretty good, pretty good saturation going in your various areas. It's kind of hard to tell where to put this, and it's hard to tell for me, too. It's because there's no set area. See, I'm just kind of trying to warm things up a little bit more in some areas. I don't have to use this everywhere that I used that previous color either. I can tell that it's kind of brightening it up a little bit, warming it up just a touch wherever I add a little bit more of this over the top of that antique linen, but it's really, really subtle. It's, I'm sure it's subtle for you watching this, if you can see anything happening at all, because it's really very, it's barely visible on you know, right for me as well. I, I mean, I can tell, but it doesn't happen very quickly. And in fact, if I was just doing this and I didn't know better, I would I would test my pad for you know dampness. I would think, oh my gosh, it's kind of dry, and that's what a lot of people used to think when they first not you know when that's when they're doing their first scene in my class when I had a lot of light values available to them. They'd go like this. And they go like this, and they think, oh my gosh, it's, you know, that pad is dry, expecting a much darker color than the color that this is. Or some people, you know, they would buy, like, Adirondack light pads from me, and they'd say, hey, you know, I got my pad, and it's dry. <laughs> and I'd have to explain to them, no, it's, it's a shadow stamping ink. You know, so it's super, you know, it's barely darker than, say, white, you know. And I know it wasn't dry, you know, you say, well, maybe it was dry, you know, but no, but, you know, any of the, these pads, you know, they, they can have a shelf life of, I don't know how many years before you even open them, and they are still really juicy. I found this Distress Ink pad, oh yeah, I could have used this one. Where was it? Weathered wood right here. And it's been sitting out in my uh, garage for 10 years. It was in a kind of a workshop bin, and that thing is still moist. And I haven't used it for those 10 years. And it's not like... I didn't have it in a Ziploc bag or anything. It was like out, you know, just sitting in a box, and that thing's still wet. Maybe not if you're in Arizona or something like that. Maybe it dries out, you know? Um, but I don't know. And something that's uh, not so arid, you know, during certain times of year and whatnot, or year-round, it's, you know, these things are pretty moist. So anyways, subtle warmth 
and layering in here. And you can see it just kind of, I put it right over the tops of some of my cooler temperatures in here as well. So again, it just kind of forms a really nice foundation. Uh, thank you, Tim Holtz, for coming up with these ones. It's just kind of nice to have kind of this aged, you know, type of, uh, don't discontinue them though. <laughs> um, aged variations of this kind of warmer, kind of more, you know, like a walnut ink spirit. I do have a bottle of walnut ink. One of these days I need to use walnut ink on a couple uh, scenes. I'm not talking walnut stain ink color. I'm talking about actually like wal walnut, uh, you know, like uh, ink that people uh, are just paint with and whatnot. Seems like it would work. Okay, so this is coming along. It's just a little bit warmer right now. It's nothing, nothing spectacular as far as uh, vast changes on here, but um, come on, you know, I didn't need a re-inker. Um, and these ink pads are not um, new. They're pretty old. At least, uh, at least 10 years, I think. Okay, so what is this one? This one, this tea dye. Test it out. It's a little bit more orangish, it looks like to me. Kind of that brownish tinge. All right. Let's tell you what, let's hit it in the shadow areas. This is a really big scene. It's almost like I, when I'm over here working, <laughs> I need to hold it out at arm's distance once in a while so I can kind of get a feel, because when you're working like this, it's sometimes you kind of forget that you, you know, you missed a spot, you know, that type of, uh, that type of uh, notion. Trying not to. Kind of giving it a little bit more spotty at this point in time. This is not a medium tone yet, but um, yeah, it's kind of getting into one of the maybe slight. Nah, I don't know. It's still pretty light, but it's starting to move into the darker light values, okay? And then we'll start moving into brighter and uh, darker and brighter. And again, one of the things I really need to uh, kind of consider on this one, I've done this real similar composition like this one before years ago. Um, and I brought a lot more reds and oranges into it, but when I was looking at my photographs, there was a lot more yellow. Did I already mention that? I can't remember, but yeah, there was a lot more yellow in those trees, and then there was kind of